Yes, I see hands rising already, so please, we'll, t we'll take a few questions and then you can respond, right? Please, is there, a, yes, there's a microphone coming up as well. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Mansoub Murshed and I uh, work at the Institute of Social Studies, which is part of the Erasmus University of Rotterdam. And I have two questions, one for Miguel, and that is, did you find that there is a literature, a separate literature, which tells us that the more, the less democratic you are, the more you dislike direct taxation. In other words, democracies are more likely to prefer direct taxation. So when you use the polity indices, unless the country is eight, nine, 10, on the polity scale, which means it's close to a perfect democracy, there is going to be a dislike for, you know, direct taxation on income and profits. And um, uh, to you, sir, um, you in your concluding statements, you mentioned the salience of fiscal institutions. Did you simply mean, or fiscal capacity, did you simply mean fiscal capacity or fiscal institutions? In other words, is it only about the design of taxation, but is it also about, you know, garnering taxation? In other words, making it acceptable to the, to the citizenship, if you like. Do we have more questions at this point, or should you? Yes, just grab it. Uh, my name is Tulio Kravo. I'm a research fellow at UNU Ida. And uh, my question is uh, for both of you, but mainly for Miguel. Uh, Santiago talked a lot about the trap in which uh, recipients of CCTs, for instance, uh, can be in, in terms of uh, incentive into going to the informal sector. And uh, thinking about the case of Africa, in which you have many pilots going on now, uh, do you think it's an opportunity to think about a third generation of, of uh, I'm going to use the social protection in, in an overall sense, uh, that there is an opportunity to come up with new institutions as these countries are building institutions uh, to provide a, a, a more integrated uh, system in which a person that is a recipient for CCT, for instance, migrates into a formal sector, which is a huge uh, challenge there given the levels of informality and low level of, cap of human capital in these countries. Well, thank you. Yes, lady over there, please. Hi, my name is Deepti Goel from the Delhi School of Economics and my question is for the first presenter. Uh, so in LIC countries, uh, you said some of the programs would lead to um, creation of new institutions, but these are precisely the countries where institutional building infrastructure is weak. So could you speak a little more on what new institutions and how you think they're going to evolve or even be created? Thank you. I think we're give the floor to you now and then you can think about more questions meanwhile miguel maybe start well thanks thank you very much for very interesting questions um on mansoor's questions on less competitive political regimes vis-a-vis -vis more democratic ones yes i think also in the context of of, of africa in particular um there are a number of factors not only the democratic transitions that are in a way preventing regimes to improve their ability to raise taxes, in particular direct income taxes. No? One is the raising middle class. No? Africa is booming, it's having a booming middle class, which are not necessarily very happy with the idea of being taxed. No? So there are, you know, there are incentives for uh, politicians and incumbents to be very cautious about 
raising taxes. In particular, when you face competition, now. you face competition, you have a middle class who is more demanding and they are more uh, also less willing often when you have dysfunctional institutions that provide very poor quality services. So it, there is a, a kind of trap in there. No? The other thing is also they are the natural resources, which is, you know, you have a lot of natural resources that you can use and therefore you incentives to actually mobilize uh, revenues from direct taxation is very low, no? because you have all these um, uh, funds coming from natural resources. So there are a lot of factors that, uh, in my view, are in a way hampering the opportunity to change um, or reform fiscal institutions in, in the region. But then certainly there are important factors uh, as well related to democratic transitions. Um, in, in relation to the new institutions, which I think Tulio's questions is related to your question about um, what we observe in, in countries which we cluster very simplistically in this leak model, um, we, we see um, very unclear patterns because uh, in particular the, the middle income countries in, in the region, um, social security is very limited. So the coverage is less than 10% uh, of the working population. So, so it, it's still very unclear to us how these social security institutions will evolve, the, uh, especially because they haven't done it even after so many years no, that were introduced. So there are a number of factors in there that haven't been uh, sufficiently important in fostering these institutions. But uh, what I mean that we are likely to see new institutions in low-income countries is because, because of the absence of social security specifically. No? So we don't have social security as such. Then uh, what it seems to us um, we are seeing is an emergence of social assistance, what we refer to social assistance, which are very poverty focused in a way, trying to deal with poverty and deprivation and vulnerability. But then it is very unclear to us, speci specifically because of the massive level of unemployment in the region, whether there will be a connection between the graduates, let's just say, of those efforts and the labor market. In, in a way, what um, Santiago was referring to. So, we see the emergence, the emergence of new institutions, but we are not clear in which direction these institutions are leading to. So, also in relation to my question, I would say both. So, there's one issue associated with how we think about fiscal policy and what is the right balance between consumption taxes, income taxes, and labor taxes. And I think partly what I'm saying here is that many of the literature associated with optimal tax design really has in mind countries whose labor markets and whose social insurance mechanisms are very distinct, at least from what is the Latin American reality. And that therefore that requires a rethinking of the design of the right mix between consumption taxes, income taxes, and labor taxes. They are all going to distort. No such thing as an undistorting tax. They're all going to distort. But what really matters here is which one will distort less and which dimensions are more important than others. So, so one issue is, yes, the design of, of, of tax policy and fiscal policy. But you also mentioned a second one which matters a lot, which is the degree to which people perceive this as pure taxes, or they perceive the association between the taxation effort and the social services that you receive as a result of them. The incentives to evade will be very differently if you're taxed 100 and you get back 19 services, whereas if you're taxed 100 and you get back 15 services. And the incentives to evade matter a lot because I didn't speak about this here, firms and workers will respond to how all this is enforced. And that will create further distortions. Firms will, might be small to avoid getting big and being taxed, so that the other side, not only is a question of fiscal design, but it's also a question of the quality in the provision of services and how citizens provide, uh, make the connection between the taxation effort and the social effort. And in these two dimensions, Latin America is not in very good shape. Of course, I'm generalizing because it varies from country to country. 
And I think it might be a relevant experience for other <coughs> regions of the world in which you probably might want to delink as much as possible the financing of social insurance from labor status and think about other sources of taxation like income taxes, consumption taxes, mineral resource taxes, or things like that. Did you talk about the uh, third generation of institutions? Yeah. Uh, you addressed that, yeah, sure. Okay, let's go on. Uh, take that, and there, and there. Here's one. Uh, thank you very much for these nice presentations. My name is Olu Ajakaye. I'm of the African Center for Shared Development in, in Nigeria. Um, first to Santiago. Um, I didn't get the motivation for moving from all this plethora of all kinds of uh, social protection instruments into consolidated CCTV. I mean, sorry, CCT. Uh, what, 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 what was the, who are the drivers? Is it, is it driven by the NGOs, is it by government concern, and all that? Number two, uh, I, 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 I like this, uh, your uh, scheme to explain how people move from formal to informal because, I mean, uh, is it because of CCTV or um, CCT or because there's a failure in the formal, which then release people to go into the informal. Uh, is, is it CCT actually that motivates people to leave formal to informal? And then movement from A to B, you know, arising from CCT, how does it work? And then finally, if we succeed, the way I'm seeing your framework, if we succeed, the need for CCT will be turning towards zero. Now, um, what has to happen? for that to be the case. And in the case of Latin America, do we have studies already showing that that trend is already evolving so that we can then learn lessons from there on the African side? Thank you. Thank you, Felipe Barrera from Harvard, and uh, now visiting a scholar at Wider. Santiago. Uh, Part of the discussion that happened in my country, Colombia, in the beginning of the uh, of, uh, of the 2000s, was precisely how can we move from a, a payroll tax uh, social protection system towards a general taxation that has a bigger coverage. However, the political economy to move from one already in place system to the other it was impossible. So. My question to you is, how can we, a country that has these institutions that are already in place, with all these bias, with all these uh, problems, to move from that system to another? What, what triggers uh, those changes? And, and if you can give us some lights on, on that uh, transition process. Thank you, Graciana del Castillo from the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. Um, I, Miguel, you, you mentioned some of the um, food aid to some of the African countries, many of which I'm working on, and then how they switch to these income uh, schemes. Now, have you seen any, how has that impacted food security, for instance? Because that, that has been one of the main issues, like countries like Liberia that you had in your sample, you know, importing rice and things like that. Do you have any uh, good data on that? And have you done any work on that specific impact of the switch? Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll take a fourth question down there before we take it back to you. Thank you very much. This is for Santiago. Well, the first question is related to the, the last one about Colombia, is that in Colombia we have done a lot of laws that have reformed the wage uh, for the formal sector, so they are aimed to enhance formal jobs, but it has been quite a few years to know if that's true, but the 
figures said very bad news about this because lowering the, the wage contributions for formal workers has not enhanced formal jobs. So maybe the answer is not that, but maybe it's a problem of productivity. So if, if it's a productivity problem, then nothing that can be done about being a formal or an informal job, uh, worker will, will help. So it's more about comparative advantage type of framework rather than a segmented labor market. So I don't know which is your view about this. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now I give it back to you. Santiago, would you like to start? Um, so, so thank you for the questions. So, so on your questions, uh, Olu, Maybe I, I, I went a little bit too fast. In my view, and some of the empirical evidence that we have from Latin America, what is causing the shifting of workers between the formal and the informal sector is not so much the CCT itself. It is the other programs, the social insurance program. Not so much the income transfer programs, but the social insurance programs. And it varies from country to country. In some countries, the contributory social programs, the social insurance, don't work really very well. So workers perceive them as a tax and first perceive them as a tax. And therefore, the, the informality that you observe is an endogenous response to the fact that here in the formal sector, taxes are very high. It's not, not so much the CCT. Now, that said, ideally what you would like to see is a labor market that is fully integrated, so that in that diagram there, the columns, instead of being two columns, there's only one column, an integrated labor market. Then you would have the problem of still the poor and the non-poor. Ideally, the CCTs or some scheme similar to that would invest in the human capital of the poor and would allow them then in an integrated labor market to move up and eventually have higher incomes. And so that the CCTs, you're quite correct, eventually should converge to zero, ideally. I mean, you will always need something because they're temporary shocks and, you know. But as a, as a large scale program, the success of these programs would be to fade. Has that ever happened in an American country? And the answer is no, not yet. And my explanation, there might be others, is that the problem is not so much in the CCT itself. The problem is in the columns. The problem is in the columns. And governments are trying to fix it, focusing on the rows. <laughs> so they ain't going to fix it, right? It, it, they're actually going to make it worse. Um, so on, on Felipe's question, um, it's really complex. Your question is really permanent, per pertinent, but it's, it's, it's really complex. So I see, first, I think there's kind of a, a big ideological barrier to think about these issues, because in the Latin American tradition, governments have done a lot of redistribution through the labor market, as opposed to doing redistribution through other instruments. The thought has been that this is a way to tax capital and transfer income from capital to labor. If you sort of think back in the 19th century when all these ideas were there, and then sort of in the early 20th century, this was a way of sort of redistributing income from, ta from capital to labor. The studies have shown that the incidence of most of these wage contributions are actually on workers. So it's a very ineffective mechanism to redistribute. But people still perceive it in their mind as a way to redistribute mechanisms. So partly there's an ideological issue. Partly, Colombia is a perfect example. Colombia is a perfect example of a country that has tried to do a huge amount of redistribution through the labor market. And not only do you do it through these uh, contributions, but you also do it, and this is partly a response to your question, through a very high minimum wage. Uh, Colombia, in fact, has probably the highest minimum wage relative to the per capita income of all of Latin America. The minimum wage in Colombia is actually at the 50th percentile of the distribution. So the minimum wage is actually 40% of the population has an income less than the minimum wage. So they're going to be in the informal sector <laughs> by the design of the minimum wage, which is so high. So it's partly a productivity problem. So yes, you can re change the contributions, but if you don't change the minimum wage, you're not going to get the sort of response that you'd like to get. Uh, so the political economy of these reforms are extremely complex, and it goes partly to Mansu's question, 
because you've got to convince people, look, I will no longer tax you in the labor market, nor I will attempt to redistribute through the labor market. I will tax you somewhere else. Where is that somewhere else? Either an income tax or a consumption tax. And then trust me, trust me, government, because I'm really a good government, trust me, that I will make a very good use of your money and I will return that money to you through really super excellent health insurance and very good pensions. That credibility problem is not there. And so we're trapped in a very bad, loose, loose equilibrium as I see it, because we don't have the institutions and the credibility of the state to be able to shift out of what is currently a very bad equilibrium. Thank you. Um, just briefly to respond to uh, Graciela. So, um, well, I think there are two primarily uh, trends, uh, as you may know. Um, in particular, in humanitarian crisis, it seems like agencies are moving towards cash, no? But um, for a number of reasons, because shipping food has proved to be very expensive, very inefficient, and, uh, and it's also promoting uh, agricultural markets in the US or in Europe where all these grains come from, no? But there are other transitions moving towards more permanent um, forms of assistance. In particular, for example, I, I can think of Ethiopian PSMP, no? Who moved from the uh, experiments of uh, delivering uh, in-kind uh, transfers to households in, in food distress to more uh, institut institutionalized forms of support, no? So the PSMP has different ways of supporting households. One is through the, the public works scheme, and then there is 20%, around 20% focus on households in extreme vulnerability, but with limited capacity to offer um, employment, yeah. no, in exchange of income. So this is, I would say, the, um, the typical case, how well these schemes have worked well. There are a number of studies there, so the results, I think, are at least um, more uh, positive than providing necessarily food, no? because of the t distortions that they generated in the 80s to the local food markets. No? So, um, but I can think about the Ethiopian as um, perhaps the best example of, of these transitions. No? Should we see if we have uh, any more pertinent questions at this point, or I see, yes, I see one hand at the very rear, please. Yeah, thank you everyone for the uh, submissions. Now, I'm troubled um, uh, when it comes to social protection and what do we know about its impact on social cohesion and social capital within, say, the African setting? Thank you. My question is simply that what's the impact of uh, the other uh, uh, social assistance programs on the cohesion that is supposed to be within an African setting? Well, <laughs> well I think it's, um, it is clear for countries coming from conflict, no? So there are a number of countries, um, we can think about Liberia, Mozambique, so all these uh, countries have experienced a number of um, uh, conflicts that, in a way, come from um, we were talking about in previous panels on conflict. No, so there are a number of historical um, ways of excluding groups. No, so um, so the extent to which these programs will succeed in containing this social discontent, I guess, is very much in the way these programs are designed. No, so uh, some programs may be more effective in dealing with the sources of conflict, uh, but at the same at the same time very much depends on the scale of this program. So at the moment, these programs are primarily pilots. So there are, there are a few examples which are um, more in institutionalized examples of trans uh, uh, social assistance, in particular in Southern Africa. But in the rest of the country, with a very few ex exceptions, in particular Ethiopia, the majority of programs, including those who have been uh, taken up by the government, like in Ghana, they are very small in scale. No? So Ghana, the, the, the coverage is about 70,000 uh, households, which is really very small, no? So, um, uh, so I guess the extent to which these programs are capable to deal with the, uh, the sources of conflict, social discontent, are very much dependent on the design and also the scale, no? OK, 
Okay, thank you. I, uh, yes, I see one more hand. I think we have time here since this is a two paper or two presentation session, please. So, um, so the change, the change from um, uh, in-kind transfer to cash transfer seems to be based on the assumption that uh, markets exist in this um, in the places where transfers is directed, and also the markets are functioning well. Is there evidence that uh, markets are actually functioning and they exist? Um, th thank you for the question. Uh, and that was also part of Olu's question before. Uh, at least in the Latin American experience, uh, uh, as far as I can tell, the motivation from changing from in-kind transfers to cash transfers was not so much a discussion between whether markets were there or markets were not there. It was a, a result of realizing that the in-kind transfers were not really solving any problem and they had been there for a long, long time. Not only were they very costly from the administrative point of view, but there was a lot of literature that showed that for many households, even poor households, if you only deliver food, you're not really building on the human capital. There was this famous saying by Paul Streeton that said that rather than subsidizing the poor, what you're doing is subsidizing the worms that live in the stomach of the poor. So what you needed to do was to bundle together basic health provision and investments in education to really be able to break the intergenerational transmission. The question of markets was discussed, at least in, in, in Mexico when I was involved in this, because in fact many people did say, look, if you just transfer income, um, there's no supply of food in these areas. And are they going to be able to translate this income into better nutrition, or are they going to translate this income into smoking and alcohol and whatnot? So what we do have now is a lot of empirical evidence which says it turned out that the supply of food was very elastic. And even in very remote rural communities, when you were distributing cash, there was a relatively rapid response of food supply by local growers, local providers, so that local markets actually developed. And the issue was no longer access to food in a physical sense, the liter of milk, the, the kilo of tortilla, the issue was really access to income, because for that, the market actually exposed turned out to work fairly well. Uh, should we take one more question here? And then we close the discussion. Um, my name is Phyllis Machio from the School of Economics, University of Nairobi. I was just, I'm just struggling to understand your um, this, I think, was the second presenter. Um, the last four boxes, the four matrices that you put up there on the transition, the columns versus the rows, and the target of um, the CCT. Um, now, suppose we give these cash transfers and we move someone from um, poor to poor, um, from poor in the informal sector to non-poor in the informal sector. Um, there seem to have a, there's, there's a problem there you said. And um, my question is, like almost currently, only less than, almost a quarter of the population in like Kenya are employed in the formal, in the, in the formal sector. Majority actually are in the informal sector. So um, my worry is, since the formal sector is already absorbing so little, what is the problem with moving someone who was in the informal sector but very poor, then we make this person become non-poor in, in the informal sector, uh, where actually, because the opportunities in the, in, the informal, in the formal are very scarce. So we are saying that, for example, we give some cash transfer to this person, we empower them, and they're able to get some money, and they set up a good business. Yes, they're in the informal, but they're still doing fine. I don't see a problem with moving up why you say it's moving up is a problem, it's, it's better for them to move across from the there to the formal 
poor. Actually, that's uh, what I'm struggling to understand, given that majority of people in our countries are actually in the informal and some are doing actually well. Thank you. So, so, so I agree with you. I, I, the way I think about it is I think about it in a sequential way. The, the first immediate policy objective is to ensure that poor people cease to be poor in some sense of access to basic health, nutrition, have, uh, and, 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 and you know, food consumption basket. We can quibble about the definition, but clearly from a policy perspective, the most urgent thing is to avoid people from being poor to non-poor. And there, I think, the CCTs can be and have shown to be very effective. If that's all that policy can do, that's what it should do, because it's going to improve the welfare of a lot of people. What I'm saying is that that might not be good enough, because you then eventually want people to also have higher incomes. And for people to have higher incomes, even if they're no longer non-poor, what they really need at the end of the day is higher productivity. The second shift from the informal to the formal sector is a way of just thinking about shifting from low productivity jobs to high productivity jobs. And there's a policy agenda, which I tend to think of as social agenda, in understanding the reasons that are impeding the formal sector to absorb more people, or that are attracting people in the informal sector. And this might change from country to country depending on the institutions, the setup, the mechanisms. So I don't think it is either or, but I kind of think of it as a sequential. Latin America started with these programs about 20 years ago. In most countries of Latin America, you have a program like this. Coverage is fairly ample, not 100%, but it's fairly ample. But now what we're learning is that yes, people have higher income levels, but they're not getting more productive jobs. And so now the challenge is to move them to the other side with higher productivity jobs. And that's where my discussion of social insurance is relevant because, again, in the Latin American context, these incentives might not be helping in that direction. I don't know, I apologize enough for Africa to say whether that is a relevant issue there or some other impediments are what it's been doing. But clearly, eventually, you want people, aside from having higher incomes through transfers, you want people to have higher incomes through their own productivity because they're getting more productive jobs. Thank you, Santiago. Uh, I think we should conclude there. I was thinking when you uh, finished your presentation, I thought of a common denominator for these two uh, regions and, and the presentations also is, is the inability of states to mobilize sufficient tax revenue and that that is really at the heart of the matter. And then I'd conclude with it's state capacity stupid or something that uh, is, the, is the final words. But then, then this discussion has also been very good and, and uh, shown more of all the similarities and differences between Latin America and Africa in terms of social protection and I guess the systems have come very different way in, in order to deal with these problems. So the final conclusion, what I bring back away from this session is that you have to think very carefully about the context in which you introduce these kind of social protection programs, whatever uh, way they are uh, designed. And that's uh, very clarifying to that today. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.